In this video, we will begin examining traffic flow theory. Consider the space-time diagram. We have time again on the x-axis, and then we have distance on the y-axis. Each of these lines is a trajectory of a vehicle. Intersecting the time axis between time t sub 5 and time t sub 6 is the vehicle on the purple trajectory. It's progressing downstream along the road. It's following another car, the blue line, which went to that same point earlier in the period. And the blue car is following the green car, and so on. The distance between those vehicles is the space headway. The amount of time between those vehicles front bumper to front bumper is the time headway. The distance on the x-axis is the time headway at any given space headway. The slope of the curve, phi is over run, is distance over time, and so that gives you speed. We have a single lane facility where vehicles are not allowed to pass each other. There shouldn't be any crossing. If there's a single lane facility and two vehicles coincide, if they've touched each other or hit each other, then this type of information we can measure traffic flow in principle. However, in theory, theory and practice are the same. In practice, they are not. In practice, we can measure various aspects of traffic flow, but it is not as accurate or compre comprehensive as we might like. Trajectory data is scarce. We want to measure the flow, which is the number of vehicles per unit time. We want to measure the speed that each vehicle is traveling in distance per unit time. Remember there are 3,600 seconds in an hour, so that the number appears in equations as a conversion factor. As long as you're keeping your units consistent, you should be able to derive these relationships with dimensional analysis. Q is the number of vehicles n times 3,600 over t sub measured, which is the measured travel time in seconds. We want to measure the density, which we represent with the letter K, which is the number of vehicles per unit length. We might measure density in vehicles per kilometer, speed in kilometers per hour, and flow in vehicles per hour. Here we define speed. There are two ways of coming up with an average speed. We can use a time mean speed, which is basically just an average, an arithmetic mean, and that's the speed of vehicles passing a point. If you go past this point, what was your speed at the time that you went past this point? For instance, we might measure speed with a radar gun or over a very small distance using two loop detectors, or we can measure speed along a segment of a road. What is the average speed over a whole stretch of road? That's called the space mean speed. And that's a harmonic mean. We've seen both of these, and they give you slightly different results. The harmonic mean is n times the length over the sum of the travel times it takes all the vehicles to go from the beginning of the stretch to the end of that stretch. So v sub t bar is the time mean speed, v sub s bar is the space mean speed. Next, we look at headway. The time headway is the time multiplied by the average space headway. The average space headway is just the speed times the average time headway. We can measure those by counting cars going past a point. We can measure the time headways very easily if we've got a detector in the road. The detector is activated at a certain point, and when it's unactivated, when the vehicle leaves the detector. Then when it's activated again, we compare the time between when it was activated the first time and when it was activated the second time, and we can calculate the time headway between the vehicles. The key relationship is Q equals K times V. This is definitional. The flow equals the density times the space mean speed. If you think about the units, vehicles per hour equals vehicles per kilometer times kilometers per hour. The space headway is also important. 1 over the average space headway is the density, or density times the space headway equals 1. Density is the vehicles per unit length. The space headway is the distance between each vehicle. These, really, these relationships, again, are all basically reworkings of what we've just seen. They're just different ways of presenting the same information. Space mean speed equals flow times the space headway. The density equals the flow times the time per unit distance. We know there must be a relationship between flow, speed, and density. This is something that we can measure, and if the density is zero, the flow must also be zero, because if the if there must be no vehicles on the roadway, there are no vehicles passing the point. If there are lots of vehicles on the roadway, but they're not going anywhere, they are stopped, that's jam density, because that's the maximum number of vehicles that you can put onto a road in principle. Usually there'll be some spacing between vehicles because even when they're stopped, they're going to want to leave a little bit of gap between each other. The flow is zero, and the density is either zero or the jam density. There's some maximum flow. The vehicles want to follow each other at some time headway because drivers are driving vehicles and they only feel comfortable if there were two seconds between each car, their car, then the maximum flow would be 1,800 vehicles per hour. 
they feel comfortable at one second between each car, the maximum flow would be 3,600. In reality, with human drivers, it is much closer to 1,800 than 3,600. As you add vehicles to the roadway, the speed probably does not go up. It might go down. Originally, these were drawn as parabolas. You'll often see that in textbooks. In practice, it's a little bit more like a triangle. This is an example. The y-axis is a five-minute flow, so the number of cars represents number represents the number of vehicles per five minutes, and the x-axis is the density in cars per lane mile. This is an example from I-94 we did a few years ago. You can see that speed isn't really dropping until you get close to capacity. When you do get close to capacity, then the speed, which is the slope of this curve, is beginning to fall. But basically, until you get close to capacity, people are driving at free flow speed, which looks like a triangle or a truncated triangle. We have different phases. Phase one is you are driving at free flow speed, unaffected by other cars in, around you, until you get really close to the capacity, at which point you can't get any more vehicles through, and if you try to load more vehicles into the system, they just go slower. And not only do they begin to go slower, at some point they begin to interfere with each other so that you cannot actually get any more vehicles through, and they're causing friction. So you're getting fewer vehicles through, less throughput. And not only is the speed lower than the free flow speed, the capacity begins to drop, in the final phase, you have some recovery. At some point, the number of vehicles that want to use the facility drop off. Everybody is left for work or everybody is left for home. You have a recovery period where the speed begins to rise again and the throughput begins to increase because you're not putting as much stress on the system. This maps to the queuing input-output diagram that we looked at in our previous lecture. We start with an uncongested region but then either the capacity drops or the number of vehicles that want to use the bottleneck increase, or both, and you get a queue forming up. You begin to see the arrivals at the back of the queue exceed the departure rate from the front of the queue. Then there's a recovery phase. These two ideas are not inconsistent. A freeway bottleneck is just like a queue, except that the vehicles are moving instead of stopped. But there's a maximum throughput. There's a server rate. And they're going through at that rate, except that the server rate is determined by the vehicles themselves, not by the system. If you had race car drivers, you get a higher throughput until they crashed, and race car drivers tend to crash a lot.